Good morning, everyone. I'm State Senator Elder Vogel. I'd like to welcome you to our joint House and Senate informational hearing this morning here at Ag Progress Days. A nice crowd here. Got a little bit of sunshine today. Obviously, we have a few more members that are uh, tied up in traffic and stuck getting into the parking lots, but we're going to go ahead and get started because the secretary and the dean are both here, and they have time constraints as well. So uh, this time, I'm going to ask uh, House Majority Leader uh, Marty Kowser to say a few words, and we'll have Senator Swank say a word, and then we'll get started. Thank you, Chairman Vogel. Good morning, everyone. It's great to be back here with all of you at Ag Progress Days. It's something we look forward to. We've got uh, an impressive uh, lineup of uh, uh, speakers this morning, so I look forward to the information that's being presented, and, uh, and I'm sure all the questions that will come. So uh, welcome to everyone, and uh, uh, thank you for being here today. Thank you and good morning everyone. I'm State Senator Judy Schwank representing um, Berks County, the 11th District. It's uh, great to be back at Ag Progress Days. A little muddy, but we all made it in and um, there's a lot of good information that's available throughout the entire uh, grounds, but hopefully some here this morning too. I'd like to offer a special uh, welcome to our FFA leadership team that's sitting always, always at these types of hearings. It's wonderful to have you here. And, uh, and many members of the audience that we recognize too, representing very diverse aspects of agriculture. Looking forward to a good hearing. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Smike. At this time, we have Secretary of Agriculture, Russell Redding, uh, give his opening remarks and his comments he has for us this morning. Senator, good morning. Uh, members of the House and Senate, thank you uh, all for the opportunity. Thanks for being at Ag Progress Days, but importantly, I uh, just want to take a moment and say thanks to, to the support all year long. Uh, we get a chance uh, today just to talk about agriculture a bit and, and see it in, in full motion uh, at Ag Progress Days and uh, how lucky we are, right, in the state to have uh, a great Ag Progress Days that gives us a field demonstration and, and uh, you know, those practical application of, of what we do in the science and extension and the technology and such, uh, but also have a farm show that allows us to sort of connect with the public. So uh, blessed in this state uh, to have, have both. Uh, do want to uh, say thanks to Dean Roush and uh, his team for hosting, uh, certainly leadership within the College of Agricultural Sciences, but also uh, what he does every day of the year in partnership with the Department of Agriculture. Uh, thank you, uh, Dean Roush and, and the entire uh, Penn State team, both uh, here at main campus and around uh, the state. Um, a couple of things that I know uh, Im important today are the questions and opportunity to sort of engage directly with, uh, with you. So I'll, I'll uh, just note that you have a copy of the testimony. Uh, that is for the record. That is a guide. Uh, I will try to highlight uh, a couple of things that are on the testimony, but uh, just consider that as the, the official record, right? And, and I'll try to, to uh, cover a couple of things that are um, uh, requested uh, of me. Um, but let me say the, uh, the challenge um, here with, with agriculture at the moment uh, is sort of economics and, and how do we um, you know, address some of these issues of economics. Some are uh, uh, market driven, others are global uh, in, in scale, uh, others are transitional. So we, we can talk more about that uh, today. But uh, it's uh, uh, important um, just to highlight a couple of things. I'll start with dairy and probably the best way to do this sort of topically. Uh, some who were at the breakfast this morning, uh, our dairy breakfast, uh, we had a chance to talk about dairy in, in some uh, detail. Uh, we continue to work on uh, the, the dairy issue. Uh, it is complex. Um, you know, in every um, aspect, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a challenge, right? Uh, but I just want to say that uh, the work that's been done, the foundational work with the Center for Dairy Excellence and the study that was done, the Ag Impact Study, uh, the Dairy Development Plan, which we released today, uh, should give us uh, a lot of comfort in a plan. Uh, we, we all sort of hope it gets better, uh, and hope is good, but hope's not a plan, right? So really trying to have something that we can lay out in front of us in some level of detail, uh, and that's what the, uh, the department's uh, uh, ag impact study and the strategic recommendations coupled with the, uh, the dairy study that looked at both our competitive footing as a dairy industry in the state but also a set of recommendations and then further building that out with the um, uh, 
dairy development plan. So we've tried to incorporate the overarching work of agriculture into the study and then further to look at a plan and building out that plan, okay? Uh, so the appropriation, the historic appropriation received in this budget of $5 million uh, is in furtherance of that plan. And the, and the goal is to uh, use uh, the $5 million to do the things that we have talked about um, uh, before, but also are embedded in both the dairy study and the plan. And they are uh, centered around research, and that's both a product research and it's a, and a processing and packaging research. Uh, it's looking at how to attract a uh, dairy processor to Pennsylvania. Uh, it's adding value to the processors we already have. If they want to do something in terms of a new product line, a uh, packaging line, it's looking at the farm level uh, value-added opportunities and, and a lot of conversations with producers who are looking at some type of value-added that could be cheese it could be ice cream and, and any number of value-added products on farm making sure that they they have access just as we would for uh, other um, uh, other businesses uh, but it also includes uh, an opportunity for transition to organic uh, production uh, and that is an important and growing uh, segment of dairy, the food system generally, but also of dairy. Uh, so we can talk more about that, but I, I want to just assure you that all the conversations we've had, uh, we feel like uh, the detail about what we're doing uh, is important. Uh, it's it's uh, the engagement of the industry at large has been very good, very um, reassuring. Um, I can tell you of all the conversations we're having both with Pennsylvania processors and those in the U.S. and around the world uh, is that Pennsylvania uh, is competitive. It is being viewed by many as an opportunity uh, over the long run given our nexus in the Northeast, given our population center, access to the ports, uh, the 60 million people in the East Coast who are increasingly desiring uh, to know about the food system and the opportunities. We think we're at the right place uh, for all of that. So uh, we can come back to that and, and talk about it. A uh, final point would just be on process. Uh, as you uh, know, the uh, appropriation included the, um, the $5 million, but also for a DCED and Department of Agriculture to work with the Commonwealth Financing Authority uh, to get those guidelines established and working hard uh, to get that done, the scheduled meeting is September the 18th for the CFA. Our goal is to have the guidelines to them for approval on the 18th of September. Uh, and that will then set in motion uh, the opportunity um, for access of those, those uh, grant dollars. Um, and, and the other point of, of opportunity with the five million is research, because there are some research components uh, identified uh, in the dairy development plan uh, that we'll need to look at. Related to dairy is school milk. Uh, we spent a lot of discussion around that and what does it look like in Pennsylvania. Uh, as we've noted, the U.S. Department of Agriculture, uh, Secretary Purdue, offered each of the states uh, last year, last uh, school year, the option because we had to actually go through a waiver request process. Uh, and we did that with our Secretary of, of Education. We went out and asked the schools to um, uh, consider the waiver, and, and we had a um, significant number do that. 324 school districts requested the waiver, and 63 individual schools requested the waiver. Uh, importantly, for this academic year, it does not require a waiver. Uh, that was a one-year effort, uh, but the, uh, hopefully the, the schools that have participated can continue without the extra effort of asking uh, for consideration and the, the opportunity to, to serve the 1% uh, flavored milk uh, in, in schools. Uh, we also understand that the, uh, the Philadelphia uh, School District, uh, 130,000 students in that district, they did not participate last year, but we understand that the Philadelphia delegation has uh, uh, sent a letter and um, requesting consideration uh, as well. So uh, we're, we're excited about that. We're also pleased with the FDA's decision to review the uh, plant-based uh, products uh, as a consideration and uh, the legalities of using the term milk. Uh, that was a decision made by the, uh, the Trump administration, which is applauded 
by all to say uh, that is a reserved word. It is statute, it is law, uh, and the adoption of that and the application of that to plant-based material uh, needs to be reviewed. So um, uh, there's an opportunity for us to sort of weigh in on what that looks like and how to manage that. But that's all in the dairy, school milk, uh, uh, federal, uh, federal action. Uh, secondly, uh, I would just say on the spot of lanternfly, and certainly when the dean um, uh, participates here and joins me, uh, we can talk more about that. But again, uh, we had uh, a town hall meeting here yesterday to talk about spot of lanternfly. Uh, it is uh, an incredibly invasive problem and pest for Pennsylvania, first time in North America uh, here uh, in Senator Schwenk's, your, your ground zero. Uh, we went from a, a municipality to a county to three counties to nine to 13 counties now under quarantine. Uh, so it, it is a challenge for us to um, contain and, and uh, control this pest. But uh, amazing sort of university uh, effort, uh, USDA effort and PDA all in this partnership, the additional $3 million for Spotted Lanternfly in this budget uh, will help us tremendously. I think you have a copy of the breakdown uh, to, uh, to show the, the $17.5 million received from the U.S. Department of Agriculture, the $3 million that we received in the appropriation here in July, and then the other contributions to, uh, out of our GGO and, and, and other sources. Uh, to give you an idea of what, what we're doing with the $3 million. But bottom line is that that problem remains a really, uh, really difficult problem of how do you control and contain the spotted lanternfly, which has uh, social impacts and economic impacts and environmental impacts. And again, we can talk uh, more about that uh, if you'd like. The, uh, the Commission for Agriculture Education Excellence, um, again, want to say thank you, uh, Representative Keller and, and others, very supportive of that effort. You've heard us talk about the importance of education in every conversation in the last couple of days that we've had here at Ag Progress Days. There is some element of education. Uh, about bringing the public into that conversation uh, uh, closer, being more uh, descriptive in terms of expectations of our educational system. Uh, so we're pleased to have the commission appointed, 13 members appointed. Uh, Senator, you serve on, on that commission. Thank you for that. Uh, we do have the report on uh, PA uh, Ag Education uh, from the task force, the set of recommendations that are in that report that will guide the new commission as well. And we're working to hire uh, the staff that is uh, called for in the, um, uh, in, in the commission. So uh, we can, again, uh, it's your pleasure to talk more about that. I do want to talk about research uh, topics. Uh, again, we're very pleased with the $2.187 million that we received in this budget. Uh, very pleased with that. Uh, the uh, research uh, priorities uh, have been identified, and there are things that uh, all of us at one point have talked about, from urban agriculture to spotted lanternfly to dairy processing to water quality concerns. So what we've tried to do uh, in that research, um, with those research dollars, and this will all be published in the Pennsylvania Bulletin in, in several weeks, is to uh, identify those issues where you have raised concerns or we have raised them with you, and try to use the resources we have to address those, uh, those uh, uh, concerns. Um, we are pleased that the uh, research appropriation includes money for Rodale uh, this year and a, and a great partner of the department and very proud that the birthplace of organics is here in Pennsylvania. Uh, it's showing up in the marketplace in a significant way. So an opportunity to work directly with Rodale on um, the research they're doing, but also expanding that. And particularly, I think, getting that to the, uh, the farm community and helping them with transition to organic uh, will be a significant uh, part of that. Um, <coughs> excuse me, final point would be just on industrial hemp to say that we're in our second year. Uh, we're making progress. Uh, we moved from um, about you know, less than 100 acres in, in uh, 2017 to over 800 acres in 2018. Um, 22 counties and, and uh, 35 different growing sites around the state. So remain uh, excited about what that crop can do uh, for Pennsylvania. Uh, it's like a lot of other agricultural discussions. It is still about a market, right? And we still have to figure that out. But there's one major impediment to that, and that is the, uh, the federal sort of uh, restriction <coughs> on uh, industrial hemp being classified as a category one drug. And we're hopeful that Senator McConnell, um, Majority Leader of the Senate, 
uh, in the farm bill, yeah, will uh, remove that impediment. Excuse me. Um, and of course, that's real time. This, this is happening as we're meeting. Uh, the conferees have been named, uh, Senator McConnell from Kentucky, the lead state with in industrial hemp production. Um, give him a lot of credit, so I'm just hopeful that the conferees can hang on to you know, what uh, uh, he has laid out. If they do, it does a really important thing for Pennsylvania. One, it gets it out of the category one ca uh, drug category, right? And that gets rid of some of the stigma, and importantly then, it, it gets rid of some of the process stuff that has been a challenge for the Department of Ag to sort of manage. <coughs> because it's, uh, as, as you have heard, there are, uh, um, yeah, there, there are checks and balances in that system, particularly with the Drug Enforcement <coughs> Agency, that really make it tough for us to, to manage. And, and then on top of that, we have to sort of protect the integrity of what it is that we're doing in the state in terms of our agronomic um, production and, and the system. So uh, we, we are as hopeful as anybody that uh, the, the Senate um, the Farm Bill and that provision prevails uh, for Pennsylvania. So uh, let, let me stop there. there. I'm sure there are a lot of other issues and interests, and I'll try to respond to those. But again, just a, a note of thanks for your support of ag and, and what you're doing to, to help Pennsylvania agriculture. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Secretary Redding, for your uh, opening comments here this morning. Uh, this time, uh, Representative Kalser <laughs> has a question. We have a, we're on quite, kind of a tight time frame. We have a, 10 minutes or so for people to ask questions, and Dean Roush will be up here next. So, But uh, you have a couple questions. But we'll start with Representative Kalser, then we'll go from there. Mr. Secretary, great to, to have you here. It's and good to see you. Appreciate you. all your good work and, and uh, appreciate your focus on, on uh, well, all the issues that you discussed, yeah. but particularly dairy because yeah. – uh, that's a main topic uh, for all of us, and I know that you've been doing a lot of work in that area. Uh, the House and Senate Ag Committees have done a lot of work in that area, and working together, we uh, did put that $5 million in the budget uh, uh, for specifically for dairy. I think there's a lot of questions from folks on how the, the guidelines are being developed, and have you had, up to this point, direct uh, uh, input in the development of those guidelines? Well, we've had a lot of input uh, you know, from industry. We, we have tried to um, uh, respond to uh, and, and respect sort of what we have said earlier about the needs, right? So primary concern has been around investment in existing or new processing, dairy processing, evaluated processing. Uh, and so uh, in terms of input, that has been sort of the, the top concern, and that, that came out of both the dairy study that was done, but also confirmation by the Center for Dairy Excellence and the dairy industry is to make sure that we're making those, those investments. Um, what has been uh, uh, the, the, the other key part of that is sort of the research piece, and we're trying to define sort of what that looks like, both in terms of the use of the five million, but also the existing ag research dollars. So short answer is yes. Uh, it hasn't been a public call for uh, input on it, but we've tried to identify, you know, those primary um, uh, uh, components that the industry has said we need, the study says we need, uh, feedback from members uh, uh, and producers alike have said that we need to do. So uh, a, lot, a lot of good input. Uh, so hopefully they respect and reflect sort of what it is that you've set as an expectation for those. I think they will. Right? There, there are two, uh, two pieces that are still sort of in play. One, is how to allocate uh, the five million between the categories. What's the threshold for each of those categories? As an example, in the value added processing, you could, you could put all five million dollars into one single dairy processing facility, right? Uh, but we think given you know, the, 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 the limited resources, but important resources, is that we're looking at that five million dollars as sort of the yeast to help raise other money. And that may be money raised within the existing uh, economic development programs of the Commonwealth. It could be U.S. Department of Agriculture or private and, and beyond. Uh, so that's, that's one of the open questions is how much within each category. Then, of course, the guidelines and what do they look like? What, what are the matching requirements that are expected? Uh, we will make sure that we uh, honor the work with DCED and getting that to the CFA. Uh, so we're, we're, we're hopeful that that, again, all tracks with what you'd expect. 
I think since we passed the budget and appropriated the money, the most common question is, so how is it going to be allocated? Yeah. So I think that's, right. uh, uh, we're getting a lot of questions from folks on that. And hopefully folks will come forward with good projects so that they can be evaluated to make the most impact uh, to help our dairy industry. So thank you for your good work. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Chairman. Yeah, you're welcome. Th thanks for the resources, by the way. I mean, I think it's historic. I mean, we've had a lot of, a lot of conversation. Everybody wants more, right? Uh, but, you know, to have $5 million reserved for dairy at such a critical time to make those strategic investments along the way uh, just invaluable to turning this conversation from one of I'm not sure we can do it to one of hope. So thank you. Thank you, uh, Secretary Redding. I appreciate more information on that as well and appreciate Chairman uh, Kowser's questions. $5 million is not a lot of money when you talk about the infrastructure that's needed for a large-scale um, processing plant. My question for you is, we've got to have a market, right? We've yes. got to have a place to put this product and a real desire on consumers' parts. Yes. What, what do we know about that? I mean, I, I recognize that you have some uh, uh, conversations that you can't divulge about what processors are interested, perhaps. But what, what are some of the things that they've talked about in terms of products that we're looking at? Yeah, no, it's a great, it's a great question. It, it, you need a market, right? right? It, you need to have the market. Uh, as I uh, often say, if you look at the dairy industry, uh, it's interesting because the fluid milk category has declined, but the other categories of dairy product have increased. So the total dairy consumption is increasing. If I felt like every category was on the downside, it would be a difficult conversation, right? So I, I look at these other, the cheeses, the, the yogurts, the ice cream, the specialty cheeses, uh, all as growth opportunities for Pennsylvania. And they happen to track with where we've had the inquiry and interest. They've been on specialty cheeses. Uh, they have been on the dairy ingredient side, right? Putting dairy into things that's not actually a dairy product uh, is sort of an interesting, right? You think about the confectionery industry in Pennsylvania. Uh, the chocolates and the candies and the snack foods as a snack food capital. There's tremendous opportunity from an ingredient standpoint to use that in other products. Uh, that's an active conversation. But we've also been reminded by the dairy processors in the state, don't forget us, right? Because the value, highest value commodity uh, category for dairy remains fluid milk in terms of return to producer. And you're seeing some interesting changes there, right? Uh, whole milk is now cool again. Uh, we have uh, this, uh, the energy drinks. You have packaging pieces. So we've had a lot of different conversations from on-farm uh, processing of yogurt, ice creams, and cheeses, uh, all the way through to significant uh, uh, company interest around specialty cheese. And then you know, think about in between that of, of uh, how to use the product or add it to or special ingredients. Uh, so it's all of the above have been interest in, interested in uh, dairy. And I, again, I think tracks with where the consumer trends are also at. Yeah. I hope that you'll be able to apprise us as you, know, you go on and as you know, this process continues so that we have a, an understanding of what is happening. I think all of us up here are in support of you know, this effort and would like to see it continue. So please keep us apprised Yeah, we will. And, and, and if, if there's something we need to do uh, in, in terms of periodic updates or a different form this needs to take to you know, provide that uh, insight on the $5 million and or other dairy uh, activity uh, open to doing that. Thank you. But again, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. I represent Delicio. Thank you, Senator. Um, good morning, Secretary. In morning. reference to the hemp industry, um, what is currently happening, and I know it's nascent, you said second year, so what is currently happening to the product that's being grown? It, and you said we need to look at market opportunities for it. Well, yes. if the farm, if this gets taken off of Schedule 1 as it should be, um, what is anticipated for the product? Does it still have to stay within the state? Can it be exported? Can it be exported internationally? Yeah, so a, a great question. Um, I, I just say that the, uh, the current product, uh, uh, the, you know, the markets are uh, you know, the, the oil, press for oil, uh, food grade oil, 
the fiber um, opportunities. There are some, uh, again, these are all research components uh, as required by the program, uh, but we have cattle feed experiments occurring. Uh, there are some CBD uh, oil extraction uh, research occurring. So all of those are current activities, right? If you remove the prohibition uh, that, that's in place, uh, you can go across state lines. That's been a major inhibitor to date. Uh, that's both on the seed sourcing as well as the end product uses. Uh, we think the opportunity for um, uh, both human nutrition and animal nutrition uh, becomes a significant discussion. Uh, in a state with 200 million cattle, horses, uh, chickens, uh, nutrition and animal nutrition becomes a really important conversation. And I think that's one of those primary opportunities for Pennsylvania. But you can export, you can move it across state lines, you can do things with it right now that we, we, we can't. So then if that were to be removed, Secretary, would our current 35 growers then become a wide open event or will we still be, is that a legislative event to not limit it? Is that's, that's, a, that's an administrative uh, structure we put in place. And now, it, it understand that our goal in 2018 was to reach a 5,000 acre mark. You know, part of the concerns expressed last year that we were too restrictive on the five acres. Uh, in talking to most of the folks who grew last year, uh, I didn't get any thank you notes from them. Uh, <laughs> but I'm pretty sure they were all thanking us for five acres just because they had to figure out how to get it in the ground, there are agronomic principles attached to it, how do you harvest this, how do you pack, all of those considerations. But this year, that went away, there's a 100 acre uh, cap, and we've got a few growers uh, who can get there. But in, in the, uh, let's assume the post uh, farm bill era, uh, the controls that we have put in place administratively go away, okay? So if a producer wants to, uh, my, my caution flag is always up. Uh, that I think one of the lessons of the last two years, even with the pilot program, is it is an opportunity and one of the few moments in history where farmers can actually control the, uh, the plant, the production, the process, the market, right? You're getting a fresh start on things that we don't have that control in corn or soybeans or cotton or rice or anything else in this country. So hemp you can do it with, right? And I think that's a really important moment to say for the producers is that there are opportunities there to build markets and control those markets. Control in the sense that you have some control of the destiny of, of that market. Uh, there's a wide open opportunity. I can go into the local convenience store and buy uh, hemp seeds. They come out of Manitoba, Canada, uh, Canada right? So there's local markets that I think are there for, for us. but. Uh, I remain optimistic about its, its potential. Uh, it has been in Pennsylvania. It's part of our history and fabric. Uh, and would love to see that come back uh, with some uh, guidance, I think, from the department, but not the excessive controls that we've been asked to take. Uh, we can help facilitate that. Well, I am excited, Mr. Secretary, and my excitement is probably only overshadowed by that of my colleague, <laughs> Representative I, I, Diving from Lebanon County. Yeah, <laughs> Thank I know. You. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Represent Representative Rabb, followed by Representative Irvin and Representative Mao. Thank you, Secretary. Uh, good to see you. Good to see you again. Um, I, I'm curious on the hemp issue. Um, what are its prospects in terms of uh, job creation and all the ancillary things that come along with, uh, with hemp cultivation in a post-Farm Bill success uh, world? Mm -hmm. what, what does... What, what do you envision for Pennsylvania um, with all the restrictions off and um, you know, the full talent of uh, the agriculture community full steam ahead? I, I think it's, it's, it's an open uh, door, right? I mean, a lot of this is going to be driven by where people see local opportunity and, and to what extent you can grow the product. I mean, again, one of those uh, caution flags is that we have, we have a green light to produce. Uh, but at this point, um, as experience has taught us, uh, it, it is still about uh, growing a good crop, right? And good crop means weed control, good crop means sort of insect control, good crop means a, a supply chain system that respects the integrity of seed, you know, product and so forth. So you can build it out. But I used a couple of the, the growers uh, this past uh, two years. You know, they're, they're, they can 
press more oil. Uh, it's going to create more jobs. You can, you know, haul this out and, and take the seeds and add value to it. You can do so many things with it that I think from a job creation standpoint, um, we shouldn't limit our thinking about its opportunity based on, you know, only what's happening. Right? You look at Canada, you look at China, you look at the United Kingdom. Um, there are tremendous opportunity there. So I think that's open-ended in terms of opportunity, but it's there. Yeah. It will require, by the way, some discussions around sort of state investment. I think that's going to be one of the issues forthcoming of how do we as a commonwealth sort of look at that investment in processing and supply chain uh, to help further that like we are with dairy or we've done, done with soybeans. Uh, thank you, Chairman Vogel. Rich Irvin, 81st District, which uh, you're sitting in right now. So it's, um, welcome everyone to the 81st District. Um, but back to dairy a little bit. I, I mean, this is a, we have a, a, a very resistant and proud group of dairy farmers across the state of Pennsylvania. And, you know, one thing that I'm not telling you, uh, but we're hearing on a daily basis at the legislative level, uh, what can you do about it? And I know we've discussed it, and I don't mean to beat a dead horse, but mm. it's not something that, and is uh, a year out. It's something that we need to do immediately because yes. we're not we're not looking at at months. We're looking at probably weeks till some of these dairy farmers, especially in our area, are going to actually lose their milk market and not know where to go. So I'm being contacted probably on a daily basis. Uh, what are we doing? What are you doing at the legislative level? So I thank you very much for that update. Yes. And even today, I had a text on my way up here from a dairy farmer that said, you know, uh, to try to bring that, uh, you know, demand for milk back, you know, which, can we get some of this into our food pantries across the state? Well, you'll find a lot of the food pantries, uh, especially in your small rural areas, do not have the adequate refrigeration system to, yeah. to store any of your milk or cheese products. So is there any way that we can look at that moving forward uh, to try to bring that generational uh, gap that we're, we're losing there of milk drinkers back into it and we can at least try to get some, some of the product out into the public? Yeah. Representative, thank you, and, and uh, certainly uh, share the, uh, you know, the worry of where we are, the pressure points, uh, that these are, uh, there, there's real lives uh, uh, in this conversation, right? There's a human on both sides of this conversation, both at the producer and the consumer side, and uh, there are folks who are, have invested generations in that farm, and, and how do you make it work? And we feel that, we feel that pressure uh, of how, trying, to, trying to help them. Um, and, and we'll do that, and that's why this uh, conversation is, is a, both a, an important sort of economic conversation for the Commonwealth, but it's also a very personal conversation for every one of the 6,500 producers in the state of Pennsylvania. We'll continue to work with them, encourage them. I think the Center for Dairy Excellence has done an extraordinary uh, job. Uh, but as we said at the dairy breakfast, you know, there's also an important element of discipline uh, in the dairy, uh, for the dairy industry. And the discipline has to come in terms of, of production. And, and the balance between what's produced and what's consumed matters a great deal. Uh, that's magnified and compounded by our trade discussions at the moment that 17% you know, of total dairy in the U.S. finds a market outside of the United States and those markets become increasingly difficult. It magnifies our, our problem. But we'll keep working with them. Right? And I, I just want uh, you know, all of those producers who are reaching out, as I, I just encourage them to look at the Center for Dairy Excellence and look at a business plan and discussions, you know, because that, that's part of it. Uh, and that's a tra maybe a transition to other uh, 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 dairy production like organic, which we can support. It may be a transition to some on-farm processing, but let's have that conversation. Uh, final point would be just about the, the food banks. Uh, I understand that Secretary Purdue has made an, a, an emergency purchase under the Temporary Emergency Food Assistance Program of $50 million for fluid milk. Uh, just in the last sort of 24 hours that that's been announced and that is product to go into the food bank and the charitable food system. That's a USDA purchase under uh, Section 32, which he has the authority to do, and I think that's significant. Final point would be within the state food purchase program, which you support in, in the budget, I think that's like at $19 million, we allow all of the food banks and lead agencies to actually use a portion of the dollars appropriated by the state uh, under the state food purchase to buy infrastructure. And that may be carts, it could be a cooler, it could be a truck, it could be something. So there's some opportunity for us to at least support them uh, in, in that uh, uh, you know, need for some refrigeration in this case. But 
Uh, and, and of course the dairy uh, industry with uh, Phil Glass with Hope have done a really nice job of making that connection between production and access to fluid milk uh, in our charitable food system. So, but, but thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. It's good, good to, to see, see you. you again. Good to see the neighbor. <laughs> Constituent, thank you. Um, we talked earlier about the competition between the milk growers and almond growers. And when Representative Keller was here a few minutes ago, we looked it up and it said that almond milk, if you will, doesn't even need to be refrigerated until after it's opened. And we made note to the fact that most grocery stores will even put their almond milk mm -hmm. in the refrigerated section right with the yeah. cow's milk. Do we need to do a better job of educating the public about the competition between cow's milk and nut milk? I, I, I want to say juice, but I'm just, you know what, yeah, I'm, yeah. what I'm getting at here. And then when it, this is like a two-part question, when it comes to marketing our milk, one of the things that, that was brought to my attention was that when we market our milk, so, uh, an example, 2% milk, is there a restriction on our, on our, uh, from the federal government that says we can't say it's 98% fat-free? Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, it's a play on words, yeah. but is that controlled by us, the feds, or can we do that? Yeah, so on, on the, uh, the top line, um, I mean, we've got to keep consumers engaged in the conversation. There's so many sort of misperceptions uh, about sort of what it is that, that milk is and its fat content, its sodium content. Uh, just make your list, right? I think there's a lot of things that are embedded in this discussion about the dairy product. You know, welfare discussions show up, the genetically engineered uh, uh, crops, the use of just the whole list that I've come to appreciate is embedded in the conversation between animal and plant-based uh, products. Right, uh, so it's, it's a lot of education that we've got to do. I am encouraged, though, uh, with the Choose PA Dairy campaign that we launched back in, in the spring, that there is a um, there's an opportunity, but there's also uh, a need to just keep saying it of what we produce here uh, uh, and what's available here, and making those connections between what uh, Pennsylvania produces and what consumers consume, and where to find that. Right. Then there's this issue of presentation of that uh, product. Uh, I don't know the specifics, but my understanding is that there is uh, a, it's a regulatory restriction on the use of uh, how do you present the fat content. That it's just not a dairy industry decision to say we're going to call it 98% fat free. Uh, you're going to have to go through uh, a, a regulatory change process to have that happen. So, so uh, the federal. feds know best when it comes to this. Uh, is, that, is that an observation or a statement? <laughs> <laughs> it's more of a question. <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, the answer is yes. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. We're out of time for you yeah. this morning. Appreciate you being here uh, with us this morning. Always great to see you, and thank you very much for your input and your um, information you've given us here this morning. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you very much. This time we have uh, Richard Roush, Dean of... College of Ag Sciences here at Penn State uh, gave us another update this morning here as well. So, Dean, good to see you this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Vogel, it's I would amplify the comments from Secretary Redding about it's great to be here with you, and uh, we're really grateful for your support of our institutions and for agriculture more generally. And thanks for um, making part of Ag, Ag Progress Day as part of your schedule. Um, I'll be able to provide the testimony to Destiny and Carrie later, but uh, I just wanted to go over some points about how the college is doing. It's been a year of achievements and successes for the college in many ways, and I'll talk about, just a, highlight a few of our successes, but it's also a period of challenge for agriculture, and we're acutely aware of it. Gary's is an example. So just a few high points. After the voluntary retirement program that Penn State offered last year, we had a large number of people in the college take early retirement packages. And we're delighted to tell you that in the last year we've hired more than 40 faculty and extension educators, new people bringing new perspectives into our organization. It's been a big success. We've also, um, on June 8th of this year, we launched, officially opened the new Agricultural and Biological Engineering Building, 
which was a $48.5 million commitment from Penn State to really build, put, build a brand new facility for us to do agriculture biological engineering, which ranges across a, a number of areas. We also had a number of corporate gifts. Uh, one in particular was to provide us with a new fermentation equipment set that came from CSL Bearing and also a German company, um, Sartoristed and Biotech. So it allows us to work more on biorenewables and other products. Penn State has allocated another $90 million to replace the Henning Building, which houses parts of veterinary bi biomedical sciences and animal science, and was really falling apart. And planning for that is furiously underway. I think the support of the Agricultural Biological Engineering Building and the Henning Building in close succession shows how strong support is among the Penn State trustees and administration for agriculture in the college. It's a really strong sign of their commitment. We're also very gratified that the Pennsylvania legislature passed and the governor signed a 3% increase for the Penn State budget and for our land script fund, and we're putting that money to good use. And thank you for that. Um, our graduation and enrollment news is terrific as well. Last spring alone, we graduated approximately 500 students of our 3,000 total that we typically have. Our 2018-19 freshman class is about 700 students. 360 of whom will enroll at University Park and the other 340 at the Commonwealth campuses spread across the state. 79% are at Pennsylvania re residents. 61% of our incoming class are women. Um, to help our students get here and succeed, we awarded $2.6 million in scholarships last year, thanks to donors from um, endowments that accre uh, accumulated from donors over decades. Since 2016, as part of Penn State's 21st Century Excellent Campaign, gifts to the college have totaled more than $48.4 million just in a couple of years, which is a testament to our support from the general community, our alumni, but not limited to our alumni, lots of other friends of the university. And they, these people tend to donate to passions that they don't see as being the responsibility of government, and they typically put them into endowments. The annual return on investment that we're allowed to spend from the endowments is about 4.5%, so the $50 million or so that we've raised will give us an additional income of about $2.25 million a year to invest in things like scholarships around the college. And so that's, that's going really well. And we're not resting on our laurels for this. Um, recent data re was recently provided that the median household income of students who applied for aid in the college is about 30% less than for the university as a whole. The median income of the students that are applying for aid in our college, 30% less than the average in the university. And further, although we award um, scholarships on the order of $4,500 a piece to our students, that total is still 1,100 short of the university average. So we're, we're not taking this lightly, and we're determined to make sure that our students are supported at least as well as anywhere else in the university. And we were really focused on trying to make sure that financing is not a barrier to students coming and succeeding with a strong student experience while they're at Penn State. Um, Extension has been uh, re reorganized to help make stakeholders' needs more effectively. We've launched Atlas, which is an innovative new internet platform, which is already getting national recognition and requests for similar assistance from other places. We're not cutting back on our traditional uh, extension activities, but in a way, one way to look at this, um, once when the washing machine, dishwasher died at our house, got jammed up with something, I went online, found five, went through five YouTube videos until I found the one that worked. Um, it was on a Sunday. I didn't want to wait around for a, a, a repairman during the week, and I got down and fixed it, right? So the question I ask a lot of people is, why wouldn't we think that people interested in our information want the same access 24-7? So we're providing it, but we're, we're, and we're hopefully doing it in a way that it handles a lot of transactional questions and actually frees up so that we have people who are available for face-to-face -face interactions more than we did before. So we're, we're working hard on that. On the research front, We've enjoyed a record high in research grants of $82 million, which is captured in national competitive programs and really depends on the basis of support we get from you all um, within the state. We need the, million, the money you provide to help provide in the research funding to help provide us the preliminary data and the competitiveness that really drives that. And it's, so it's very successful. We're, we're using about $25 million of the money you provide us. And we're getting a return in terms of our competitive grants of $82 million on a national competitive basis. There are challenges, though, to agriculture. And as I said, dairy's already been touched on. I'll come back to that in a moment. Spotted landerfly is a huge issue. Um, and for, it's difficult to assess just how important it will be. 
Um, but on the basis that we've seen already in terms of its damage to grapes, its wide host range and so forth, I don't think it's a, an exaggeration to say that it could be the worst invasive insect pest we've had in the United States since the gypsy moth 150 years ago. And it's a significant threat to Pennsylvania agriculture, landscapes, and natural ecosystems, tree fruit, nursery, and hardwood industries, especially if those become quarantined because of the possible presence of egg masses on them. Um, we find that it li likes a wide range of host plants, and the USDA has recently found that um, it likes hops even better than um, Tree of Heaven in laboratory trials. Um, as part of the partnership with the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture, the Pennsylvania uh, Lanternfly uh, website is readily available. And for anybody here in the group or in the audience, we've got a booth outside. I just refer you to go there and pick up some of the literature to get introduced to it. But it's a real threat, and as many of you know already from the Berks County area, just the impact on landowners in terms of the sticky mess created by this insect will have um, a huge effect on, on the quality of life people can have with its presence. So we're really working pretty hard on this. There are lots of challenges. I'd say of the 17 million that was allocated to the USA, you may know that 1.25 million was provided to Extension to help provide these materials and get the word out. One of the weaknesses of this insect is that it's easily recognized, and we have examples outside. And we really want to try to exploit that weakness by engaging the public as much as possible to recognize this insect and, it, and let us know if, if, it, um, it, if it's found in areas that are outside the existing quarantine. But I, but I also have to say the feedback we're getting from a lot of researchers is the populations are quite high in things like black walnut and so forth this time of year. And I think that um, we, uh, in support of our, my colleagues, and the Secretary in the Department of Agriculture, probably a lot more resources are required to go after it in terms of suppressing it. And we're also really lucky that we've got a strong interest among um, the public citizens of the state who are able to use a wider range of insecticides in particular for controlling it on more hosts than is currently available otherwise. And one of the things we've tried to do for our extension is, is um, collect as much data as we could in real time about our trials for insecticides and turn that around and make it available to people on a weekly basis updating what we know about the best insecticides. And we also have a long history of looking at a lot of these same insecticides in terms of their effects on pollinators. So we're making sure that we weigh that in and the kinds of advice we give to people. So it's, it, but is this gonna be a huge challenge? It's not one we're gonna get away with for very long. At the same time, we, we can't afford to allow ourselves to be distracted by some of the other things we've been working on. And one of those is water quality. It's a key, key issue for the college. And much of the significant acti activity in Pennsylvania right now is on the next Phase three watership, watershed implementation plan. Matt Royer represents the college and co-chairs um, the agriculture work group in that, so, and we're really engaged. We're also very much interested in stormwater, and we, we propose to create a program called Master Water Stewards that in some peril have a highly successful Master Gardener program, which includes 3,000 volunteers across the state to see if we can increase the number of volunteers who will be engaged, especially in things like community efforts to manage stormwater. So we, there, there's things there that we want to further develop. Another uh, major challenge across the state that we're really interested in working on is op opioid addiction. So over the last 15 years or so, we've been engaged in a research extension project with the College of Health and Human Development at Penn State to investigate a program called PROSPER, which stands for Promoting School, Community, University Partnerships to Enhance Resilience. And this has been proven scientifically to pro provide high quality prevention programs for youth and their families. We're working at about a dozen communities currently and we're looking for resources federally to expand that to more areas. But we'd also like to talk with you about how we can do more of that in Pennsylvania, particularly in rural areas where it's been most, uh, most extensively tested. My fourth and final example is, of course, the dairy industry. And just, uh, again, amplifying the point Secretary Redding made, it's a really big issue. Um, I was much uh, impressed with the uh, report that um, Chuck Nicholson presented at the Dairy Breakfast last year. We argued that cheese production is something we need to look at harder. And Nick Jones, who's our provost, uh, introduced me to a couple of his relatives who work for Fonterra in New Zealand. And they pointed out that a big part of what they're trying to do right now is export cheese to China because the Chinese millennials like it on pizza. It's really a difficult time. I've been to China a half dozen times, and they're not a milk product consuming country. So this was actually a pretty big breakthrough. 
Um, maybe that's going to be more difficult in the current political climate, but we're still very committed and interested in cheese. And I, and I did also was delighted to hear this morning that the, that the idea of looking at processing facilities has been uh, advanced to the point where um, uh, Reading and State College have been identified as, as ideal places to site such a facility. And Secretary Redding and Abe Harpster and others knows for the last year I've argued that um, a real asset we have in Pennsylvania that others don't have is that we have a strong food science department and the cr building where the creamery sits it doesn't just make ice cream or research ice cream. We have a, a broad range of dairy interests there and we also have a sensory lab at a commercial level sensory lab staffed by two of our faculty so we can evaluate what people might like and look to new markets using the capa capacity that we, we have there to try out new cheeses. So um, we're you know, prepared and ready to engage this at any time. So to sum up, we, as a college we've had a great year with many successes, but we're acutely aware that there's still huge problems out there. And we remain dedicated to improving agriculture and rural life throughout Pennsylvania. I'll close there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dean, for your uh, opening comments here. At this time, uh, Senator Swank has a question for you. I'm reminded, Dean Roush, as you ran through that list of things that the College of Agricultural Sciences is doing for us, how important you are Thank to you. this Commonwealth. I mean, the diversity of the issues, everything from stormwater to spotted lanternfly to food products and processing, pretty important. You, you have your own specific expertise in spotted lantern fly. Right. So one of the, I, and, and you know, we're ground zero here in, in Berks County. Representative Gillen is sitting next to me. We share the district. Um, one of the things that consumers say to me, why can't you just spray it like you did the gypsy moth? Why, you know, gypsy moth, we were able to spray using aerial spraying um, a biological agent, uh, BT, to um, help control it. What's, what are the prospects for us when you look at, you know, now you talked about walnut, black walnut and forest trees. That's our, one of our biggest exports in Pennsylvania. Yeah. It's a huge, huge crop for us. What, what, how are we going to protect that? And how are we going to do this on a wide scale basis? And one more thing, is eradication a word we should be using in terms of spotted lanternfly? Yeah. I have my own opinions on yeah, that, but so, I want to hear yours. So um, it's, it's still theoretically possible, but I think most people who've had experience with these sort of things say at this point, you know, it's going to be pretty tough. And, and I should, as you've alluded to, I've had a lot of experience with this. I've served on review panels, chaired review panels for eradication of fire ant for Brisbane, Australia, Mexican fruit fly in Southern California for the Department of Agriculture in California, weed examples and so forth. So yeah, I think it's a, it's a challenge at this point. And a lot of what our thinking is, okay, it's time to start thinking about moving on to the next phase. Now, it's fortunate that one of the weaknesses of the gypsy moth was it was very susceptible to Bacillus thuringiensis. But Bacillus thuringiensis spray basically only works at caterpillars, some on Colorado potato beetles, but some strains, but they have to feed on the plant. And this monster of an insect sticks its uh, strong proboscis right into the trees and starts sucking out of the flow of the plants. And um, sucking pests have always been a real challenge for us to come up with safe, effective, biologically acceptable insecticides. There, is, there are efforts to look at some of the ones that are out there, um, but it, we're, not, we're not too surprised their efficacy doesn't seem to be very good. So a lot of strategy currently to try to minimize the non-target damage to do stem injections of systemic insecticides that will essentially stay within the tree but it's expensive and you have to go through one by one. And yes, one of the things I think really challenges is what are we gonna do in forestry? And I think one of the things we have to accelerate is that um, there are two species of parasitic wasps known to attack this insect in China. There are a couple of researchers in the US Department of Agriculture who have been studying it, went over there, have brought specimens back. I know one of them really well. Um, I've, I've been urging since March with the USDA that some of the money they allocated, that, that there really should be an increased effort that, in that to accelerate it, to introduce a biological control agent to make sure that we don't have any possible effects on non-target organisms requires extensive specificity testing and analysis, and those studies usually take years. And what we really need to do at this point is put more effort into it and compress that timeline and get those things out there. The other thing we're, we're starting to do is to map out what in entomology we call an area-wide pest management program where we really need to understand what the various host plants contribute to population growth 
So they are feeding on black walnut and using it for some of their life cycle. What are the key plants that really drive population dynamics? How can we focus on those? And, and really looking at how, to, how we do um, sort of GIS mapping of the spread of the insect or how it might spread on the basis of its temperature preferences and host plant preferences to figure out how we can start to manage this thing and in particular deploy our assets to best protect high value things such as forestry and key fruit crops. So we're, we're you know, a big part of what we're trying to do this fall now that we're seeing where the insects are moving is our research team on spotted lanternfly in the college has grown from about half a dozen to 20 and it includes a lot of people who are going to be out looking at what's going on in the forest over the next month and a half while the insects are still very active outside. That's good to know. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Pashinsky. <clears throat> thank you very much, Senator, and thank you very much, Dean, for being here. Uh, you and, um, and, and uh, Senator Redding you know, are very well informed about everything. My question actually was similar to uh, Senator Schwank, and I was wondering how close we are to an actual um, chemical that could actually eliminate this, and you've already answered part of that yeah. question. Uh, but, you know, what else can we do? Uh, we talked about the gypsy moth, and uh, there we do have uh, insecticides that can kill the gypsy moth, but then we didn't have enough money to allocate for spraying. Certainly in the Northeast, we lost uh, a lot of wonderful oak trees because of that. Uh, is that still uh, also a part of the problem, that there's not enough money to be able to accelerate the research, to be able to... Yeah. Find, okay. I, th I think, so unfortunately, one of the things that happened in the competitive grant programs nationally, and it actually came back in the reviewer comments on some of the grant proposals, that people misunderstood that the $17 million that had been allocated by the USDA could be used for research, or was being used for research. So some of the reviews actually came back oh, well, they don't really need this money now that the USDA has put in $17 million. So there's, there's an education program for the reviewers. But we're definitely going to need increased funding for research to get on top of some, some of these questions and rapidly. And I think within the quarantine zone itself, dare I say, PDA is going to need extra help to actually help get on top of the beast. And, and again, I know Penn State's on top of this. Is there any collaboration with any other universities? Oh, that absolutely. Are doing, okay. Yeah, we're working with... We certainly got contacts with the USDA, particularly the Agricultural Research Service. We're, we're other, um, Julie Urban, who's a re, one of our lead researchers on this, is extremely well connected. In fact, I attended a meeting that she organized on spur of the moment at the National Entomology Society meeting last November and December. And she turned up a dozen um, people work in this area. And it was clear to me, from sitting in the room, that she was really the leader. So we're, we're well set up that way. So then, to come back to the original question. How close are we to determining an insecticide that's oh. going to be able to eradicate this? Well, we probably, we have insecticides that are very effective if we could apply, uh, you know, apply them enough to enough places, but it, it, it's costly. It'll take a lot of money to do it. And I think, you know, we're... How we're, much? Oh. You know, probably 10 million at least. I think. Okay, when, when you think $10 million, it's a lot of money. Sure. When you think the devastation of our forest and our and, grapes and everything, it's not a lot of money. And, and the threat everywhere. And, and, but it'll be more than just money because we probably don't have enough personnel on the ground that are trained well enough to do it yet. But either. again, this is, my, this is yeah. my point. It seems to me that this invasive species yeah. could devastate <laughs> Pennsylvania. Yeah. Could then move on to Ohio, New York, wherever there was food. So uh, I'm, I'm looking for the all-hands-on-deck plan to yeah. say, what do we have to do to attack this invasive species and eradicate it? Yeah, well, we're, we're trying to organize a teleconference of the USDA ourselves and um, PD, the Department of Agriculture uh, for next week so we can start canvassing. Now that we're getting a better sense of where everything is, to start talking about those questions, including um, maybe doing another environmental assessment that they propose that, that some, to some extent limits the, to treat just one of the host plants, Tree of Heaven, at present. Okay, just, I well, think you can count on us. I mean, if, if it's all hands on deck, it means all hands on deck, and $10 million to me is a small amount of money to save the forest of Pennsylvania. And probably save forests across much of the rest of the country. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dean Roush, for your being here this morning. I know you're a busy man. I appreciate you coming, giving us the information, an update on the College of Sciences, Agricultural Sciences here at Penn State. So uh, thank you very much for being here with us this morning. You're welcome, and thanks for your deep and abiding interest. You're welcome. At this time, we have a, our panel discussion coming up. We have Hannah Smith-Brewbaker, the Executive Director of PASA, 
Rick Ebert, President of Pennsylvania Farm Bureau, Chris Herr, Executive Vice, Pre Vice President of Penn Ag, and uh, Wayne Campbell, President of Pennsylvania State Grange, to come up and do a panel discussion for us next year. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for being here with us this morning again at Ag Progress Days here. Uh, this time, uh, you can start uh, however you want to start. Ladies first, I don't care. Uh, and then uh, work your way down across the panel and uh, give us your information this morning. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you, Representatives Causer and Pashinsky, Senators Vogel and Schwenk, and members for this opportunity. Since it's been a while um, since I've sat before some of you, my name is Hannah Smith Brubaker, and I farm with my family just south of here in Juniata County, though our largest uh, direct market customer base is right here in Center County. We are a certified organic produce and pastured livestock farm. We've been certified organic for nearly 30 years. My children, should they choose to come back to the farm after college, would be fourth generation organic farmers. Their great grandfather was a very early pioneer milling organic grains at the grist mill around which our farm was formed and through which one of the earliest canals ran, distributing product through which some people may say was a much more efficient local food distribution system than we have today. As with many family farms, one of us works off farm, and that's me. I know some of you from my time serving as Deputy Secretary of Agriculture with Secretary Redding, until upon my request, he graciously released me from service to take on the Executive Director position at PASA. PASA is a Pennsylvania-based sustainable agriculture association working to build a more economically just environmentally regenerative and community focused food system through education and research that directly supports farmers. We coordinate year-round workshops and events, administer formal farming apprenticeships, and facilitate research that empowers farmers with data that they value. We also work to foster productive connections between farmers, community members, local businesses, policymakers and other stakeholders, and this often means reaching out to our partners in order to better deliver on farmer needs. Only two weeks ago, PASA, the Pennsylvania Farmers Union, Pennsylvania Certified Organic, and the Center County Farm Bureau, for the first time in our organization's history, co-hosted an event together, and I hope that we see more collaboration like that. <clears throat> Through our Dairy Grazing Apprenticeship Program, which is a two-year paid apprenticeship program matching apprentices with master grazers, uh, we are partnering with the Center for Dairy Excellence to match apprentices with now more than a dozen master grazers throughout the state, many of them in your districts. And thank you, uh, Secretary Redding, for your comments on the importance of organic dairy and value-added products in answering our dairy crisis. On the research front, we are working with the Northeast, with the Northeast Cover Crop Council and the Rodale Institute, and it's that work that I'd like to take a moment to highlight. PASA's Soil Health Benchmark Study is a citizen scientist project led by farmers. It began in 2016, and the study helps farmers comprehensively test the health of their soils using physical, biological, and chemical soil health indicators um, to get at the very important questions that we're facing today. PASA compiles these data from individual farms to establish soil health benchmarks, which can help farmers everywhere 
more effectively assess their soil management techniques and the desired results. Each farm participating in these studies also serves as a case study site for soil sampling and on-farm data collection. Participants, and we all know how independent farmers are, participants share their management records with other farmers to build a deeper understanding of how an individual farm's approach to soil health compares to other farms in their region. PASA also organizes research forums for farmers to collectively develop innovative yet practical solutions to common soil health questions and challenges. This project and the power of it lies in the fact that it involves organic vegetable farmers, conventional no-till row crop farmers, and grazing dairy farmers to share data and ideas with each other. And I would argue that this is rather landmark and game-changing. One of the exciting things that we're learning so far is that soil Soil health is not limited to a set of prescriptive practices. Different farms can develop different pathways to grow soil health. And as we speak, we have more farmers interested in enrolling in our research studies than we can possibly accommodate. We're very far, uh, fortunate to enter into a partnership with USDA um, Agricultural Research Service and to receive funding from several private foundations as well as a highly competitive USDA NRCS Conservation Innovation Grant for this exciting project. More than any other industry, farming is profoundly affected by significant weather events. Fortunately, investing in soil health, for which there's already broad support, is also a great way for farmers to adapt to climate change. But to really prepare, we will need significantly more public support for agricultural research and education. Taxpayers must often foot the bill for the weather damage on farms and in our communities. We know that between 2011 and 2016, flood and drought-related claims to the taxpayer-funded federal crop insurance program resulted in $38.5 billion in payouts to farmers, approximately two-thirds of the entire program was to pay for the, the damage caused by these extreme weather events. Since the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA, projects not necessarily dramatically higher temperatures for Pennsylvania in the next 10 years, but rather dramatic increases in flash precipitation, and as a farmer who received in the last two weeks 15 inches of rain in three days, our entire fall uh, crops have been destroyed. Um, and also short-term uh, droughts. It is imperative that we are prepared. Thank you for your support in this year's budget for agricultural research, and we urge you to continue to target agricultural research funding specifically for climate risk mitigation strategies. Our collective future depends upon it. Thank you. Good morning, Senator Vogel, and uh, again, thank you for inviting us all to be here. My name is Wayne Campbell. I am president of the Pennsylvania State Grange. I'll give you a little bit about my background to understand more where I'm coming from. I was a dairy farmer until 1981. After that, I repaired farm equipment for several years. After that, I went to work for General Motors dealership in which I was a warranty administrator and then the service manager. After that, I went to work for a John Deere company. I was a service manager and then the store manager. Then I went, was foolish enough to go back into the auto industry and worked as a service manager at a used car facility for a little over five years when my wife said it was time for me to slow down. So I semi-retired and I went to work driving a transportation bus in Perry County, which I will admit was some 14 of the best months of my life helping senior citizens do that. 
After that, I ended up in this position as pe uh, president of the Pennsylvania State Grange. Now you're probably wondering, well, why is he going on all that? With all of that, as you know, the Grange is an organization that involves members from the age of five for the rest of their lives. We have probably one of the most diverse organizations in America, and our issues are just as diverse. The last few years, one of our issues has been broadband. And everyone who has spoken here today, whether they know it or not, is concerned about broadband. I see Representative Pam Snyder shaking her head. She is definitely you know, a, a friend of the Pennsylvania State Grange. Her and several other representatives uh, are on the Broadband Caucus. I'll, if you, I'll take a moment, uh, Chairman uh, Martin Kosser, Eddie Day Paskinski, Pam Snyder, Dave Millard, Gary Day, Karen Boback, uh, Kate Klunk, and Rich Irvin as of um, July 20th, if uh, or those were the people on the uh, caucus. If I've missed anybody, I apologize. But broadband, the Pennsylvania State Grange, the National Grange, local granges have gotten involved in broadband several years ago because without adequate broadband, people today just cannot move forward. Uh, the Grange was instrumental in getting royal free delivery mail service out into the countryside, rural electrification, paved roads. So many of our citizens that are rural and urban don't realize what the Grange has done for them over the years. And as I tell people as I travel throughout the state, whether you're a Grange member or not, we fight for you every day in Harrisburg and Washington to make your life better. The one of the reasons that we're addressing broadband the way we are. And each of these issues to me is equally important. But when you have parents come to you and say, I have to take my children to school an hour early so they can do their homework because we don't have internet service at home or they have to stay an hour late after school because they can't do their homework at home. Uh, you buy a piece of farm equipment today. It's GPS equipped. It has the technology that auto manufacturers have used for years. Uh, if any of you that own a GM car and, and you have the GPS in it that tells you where to, how to get somewhere, and what, if you need emergency help, you can use it. That technology is available in today's equipment. I know John Deere, when I left John Deere at the time, was in the process of getting to the point where if a tractor had an, an issue, it would actually broadcast that issue to John Deere. They would notify the dealers, and if the owner hadn't already called John the dealership, the dealership would contact them. Because if you're riding around on a couple hundred thousand dollar machine, you don't want that unit damaged, because when you're down, you're not making money. Telemedicine, our seniors. When I, when I drove for transportation, I would pick people up in Perry County at one end of the county, it might be six, eight hours later till I got them back home from a 15-minute doctor appointment. It totally wiped them out for the day. With telemedicine, they could do that doctor's visit over the internet, spend 15 minutes from their home, and not have to travel on a bus for three hours to get from the western end of Perry County to Camp Hill. So everything that we've talked about here today, when Secretary Redding talked about the milk industry, Again, it's education, it, it's marketing, it's being available to the people of Pennsylvania. So our national president with the, with the National Grange, Betsy Uber, is with me here today. And Betsy is actually on an FCC advisory board to work with the FCC and come up with solutions. The Pennsylvania State Grange and National Grange supports the implementation of small cell facilities that could be used in local areas to improve broadband. And uh, again, broadband is not just your cell phone. It's your internet access, it's everything. Um, whenever I was at, in Berks County, in a, at a place called Virginville, which is not that far from Philadelphia, one night I, w I took photos and I was gonna send them back to Lizzie Bailey, our membership director, and the lady beside me said, Wayne, what are you doing? And I told her, she goes, no, you're not. And I thought, oh, did I do something wrong? She goes, no. 
We don't have internet here. I, I said, come on, you're right in the middle of Berks County. She was right. When I left town and went up around the hill at the end of town, my phone beeped and I handed it to my wife and sure enough, all the photos I had taken just left. So all the things that I've just addressed here, those people in that town, right in the middle of Berks County, could not take advantage of. So um, with, with that, I'd, I'd like to say thank you. I'll wrap up my remarks. I'd like to thank you, each and every one of you, for allowing us to come here and talk today. And hopefully I've given you some insight and some things to take back home. Good morning, members of the Senate and House Agriculture and Rural Affairs Committee. Uh, my name is Rick Ebert. I am president of Pennsylvania Farm Bureau, and I am also a dairy farmer from Westmoreland County. I want to offer some thoughts today on several legislative issues that we are tracking. Uh, but first of all, on behalf of our farmers, I want to thank members of the House and Senate for such strong investments uh, in agriculture's um, ag budget this year. Uh, programs like Penn State Extension, uh, the Department of Agriculture, and others have helped make uh, help farmers make smart business decisions, uh, particularly in these times of low prices. In addition, we are pleased to see the attention that was given to the crisis faced by our dairy farmers, including the new state grants for on-farm value added processing and marketing studies and other measures that were advanced in June here. We know there are limits that the state government can take to help solve the dairy prices, but you know, because dairy is so intertwined with the supply and demand economics. But the measures that Pennsylvania has taken is helpful and very much appreciated. As we look to the future, both over the short and long term, we feel there are further steps government should take to help our farm families meet these current challenges. Pennsylvania Farm Bureau's chief legislative effort this session is to ensure that farmers who are operating agritour businesses are granted reasonable civil immunity for their businesses. We believe Senate Bill 820 strikes a reasonable balance between identifying the hazards that a farmer cannot take away from their businesses while protecting the public's right to seek damages in cases of truly negligent actions. Farmers in neighboring states like New York and Ohio have very similar protections for civil liabilities. I don't believe it's right or fair that our farm families operate at a uh, competitive disadvantage to their neighbors. We believe it is reasonable to give Pennsylvania farmers the same basic level of civil liability protection. Now more than ever, farmers are looking to diversify and agritourism is a great option for many farmers because it taps into that growing interest of local foods and, and information. However, the biggest barriers that farmers face with starting agritourism is the cost and availability of insurance. Many carriers in the state are very hesitant to write affordable policies for agritourism because of civil liability. Passing Senate Bill 820 would remove a significant barrier that farmers are facing in starting a new line of business, and it would be another way for state government to help farmers in these tough economic times. I also want to discuss two longer term issues that we feel state government must address in the coming year. First, expanding the broadband service throughout Pennsylvania, as the Grange is also supporting very much. Tele communicating is not possible in large swath of rural Pennsylvania. It's tough to track new business ventures or people looking to relay, relocate to rural communities without reliable internet services. Rural health systems cannot take advantage of the cost savings offered by telemedicine. Many rural children cannot complete homework assignments online without having this type of service. And our farmers cannot take advantage of the technology available to them that is transforming agriculture today. Quite simply, state government has to invest time and resources into delivering reliable high-speed internet service in the rural Pennsylvania. 
whether it's creating public-private partnerships or creating grants or loans for last mile infrastructure. Pennsylvania government will need to make financial investments to expanding broadband service into more areas. We cannot let rural Pennsylvania further slip, be, slip behind in the digital divide. Pennsylvania Farm Bureau is ready to work with lawmakers at the state and federal level to make this reality happen. Lastly, Pennsylvania farm families have continued to invest their own time and resources to improve the environmental practices on their farms. Whether it's switching their cropping strategies to include no-till or investing in new manure management sto manure storage systems. Farmers are making those necessary changes that improve water quality and soil health. However, the degree of nutrient reduction needs to happen in order to achieve goals set in the Chesapeake Bay cleanup plan are daunting. Realistically, they won't be achieved without a serious commitment of financial and technical assistance. Pennsylvania Farm Bureau is participating with several groups forming recommendations for the next phase of the Chesapeake WIP 3 program. One solution highlighted in those meetings is the need to significantly expand forest buffers along creeks and streams. The best estimate that suggests the transforming of an additional 25% of agricultural land into buffers will reduce phosphorus going into waterways by nearly 50%. However, the cost of reaching that goal will be around $45 million. Farm Bureau believes that the state will need to create incentives that offset some of the cost of taking land out of production for the creation of buffers. A loss of farmland, even a 35 foot wide strip of land along a creek does hit the bottom line of farm families. We believe the creation of an incentive program to help farmers pay for the productivity lost through forest buffers may further encourage voluntary participation in the ag community. Ideas to, provi to provide landowners to develop forest buffers with income and property tax breaks and other financial incentives help landowners develop creative land use plans to generate additional income through buffer enhancement and amending REAP and other existing conservation programs to encourage and accommodate buffer development will encourage the level of land over participation needed to Pennsylvania towards reaching its Bay goals. Farmers will need state government to provide guidance and assistance to help us meet these next set of challenges. A significant number of farmers are re already making strides on their own to improve their conservation practices. However, I think we all have to be practical as we face down a rather daunting set of conservation challenges imposed by the Chesapeake Bay watershed cleanup. Farmers are willing to do their part, but they will need help to meet these future challenges. Thank you for giving Farm Bureau the opportunity to offer these perspectives on these issues, and I'd be happy to answer any questions later on. Chairman and members of the Ag Committee, it's a pleasure to be here on behalf of the 500 agribusiness members of Penn Ag Industries. Um, so fortunate to uh, look up there and realize that, that our association has a personal relationship with uh, every one of you, and, and uh, we've been able to foster that over the years. And uh, can't uh, tell you enough how much we appreciate that and, and thank you for um, all that you do. Uh, it's great to be on this panel with uh, this diverse group of uh, um, folks representing agriculture, I can tell you there's lots more out there. It's great to have a relationship with the Department of Agriculture, Penn State, uh, Delaware Valley University, Penn Vet School, um, you know, so many, uh, the FFA officers and, and uh, you know, really work together. And, and along with that, the, the uh, relationship with um, sometimes the bad words in, in uh, agriculture, folks like DEP and EPA. I think we have a great working relationship with them and, and it is, uh, um, you know, fostered uh, progress in the agriculture area. Um, it, it's, um, 
you know, appropriate to thank you because it's been a tough three-year stretch. Uh, I wasn't sure what I was going to do with myself uh, this uh, late June, July, and August because uh, it hadn't been it'd been a while since we actually, uh, um, you know, had those times off, and, a, and an early budget was really appreciated. But uh, you know, prior to that, you you really stepped up, and and uh, uh, whether it was avian influenza in 2015. Uh, you know, reinstating dollars to Penn State and Penn Vet School, um, you know, in the subsequent years. Uh, we just can't thank you enough for uh, um, representing agriculture as you have and, and able to take uh, the important message uh, from your Ag Committee to the other 253 members of the legislature and really, really get it done. And I feel that uh, we can't thank uh, you and your staff. Uh, fortunate to have, uh, you know, Carrie and Destiny, Matt, and Bill uh, do a phenomenal job on your behalf when, when you're, uh, you're not available. Um, a couple of, uh, of things I want to echo were a lot of discussion about dairy. Uh, obviously, the members of Penn Ag are instrumentally involved in feeding and supporting the dairy industry, and that can't be uh, overstated. I don't want to forget about some of the really evolving uh, industries here in Pennsylvania. We have the poultry and, and hog industry well represented. Um, well organized and sometimes an afterthought when we talk about these issues, but I think uh, the future expansion of, of the poultry and the hog industry here in Pennsylvania uh, should be part of the solution uh, um, when we're talking about the dairy industry. Diversifying Pennsylvania farms um, is critical. There has been upwards of a billion dollars in private investment in those two industry sectors on their own. Um, recognizing the value of, of those industries, the potential for exports, the potential for diversification. Uh, Pennsylvania has the largest organic uh, poultry flock uh, in, in the United States. Uh, so those types of areas, we're already working on many of those areas that dairy's looking at and, and would really uh, appreciate uh, uh, being part of that. Uh, with that, though, there are challenges, you know, the ability to grow quickly, um, the ability to get the permits and, and uh, meet the demands of the, uh, um, you know, the markets that are expanding is, is critical and having the relationships at, at DEP and, and you encouraging those types of things to move that along is, is critical. But, uh, you know, with that, I know we want to stay on schedule. Um, thank you again for all that you have done and, and all the water that you've carried on behalf of Penn Ag and, and all of agriculture um, all the time. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you to all our panel members here this morning. We have about 10 minutes for questions, so I know we're uh, going to be short here. We have a couple of people up here that want to ask questions, so we'll start with Representative Kowser and try to make them quick if we can. Thank you all for being here today, and you're all leaders uh, in promoting and, and uh, helping Pennsylvania agri and we're glad to partner with you and work with you. Um, you've touched on so many issues, and I'm going to be brief. I, the one that I wanted to, uh, to touch on is the rural broadband issue, and I know the Grange and the Farm Bureau have been uh, working on that for, for quite some time. You guys are truly leaders in pushing that issue uh, forward. Representing a district that's probably the most rural in Pennsylvania, I understand what you're talking about. And, uh, uh, and, and have actually introduced legislation myself to try to coordinate that, some of that effort to promote broadband uh, across the state because we know that in rural Pennsylvania, broadband's not a luxury, it's a necessity. And so more of a comment than a question, certainly looking forward to working with all of you to try to uh, work together. It's not a partisan issue in any way, work together to promote broadband in rural PA. And I can, I'm sure that I speak for everyone up here that we're all interested in working with you to, uh, to promote rural broadband. So thank you for all, uh, all your leadership and all that you do. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Senator Street. Uh, uh, good morning. Good morning. Um, I was interested in um, some of the issues around uh, our figuring out how to expand our dairy market. Um, I know that we've talked a lot about the fact that added value um, processed dairy products are growing, for instance, like yogurt and cheese. One of the things that I haven't heard today that I know that I've had some conversations about is that there are some, one of the challenges with getting a uh, cheese or yogurt processing plant has to do with the uh, wastewater regulations for the Chesapeake Bay Commission and how that increases the uh, increases the challenge. Uh, but I hadn't heard any talk about the fact that if you were to put a, such a facility in the southeast, in uh, Philadelphia or Montgomery, Delaware, in our in our region, 
uh, you wouldn't have the we're outside of the Chesapeake Bay commi uh, Commission. We don't we don't we don't empty into it, and so that might be a way to do it. And probably it would be just as accessible for purposes of uh, processing Pennsylvania dairy, and maybe and, and because of clo uh, the uh, close proximity to both rail and uh, and and shipping and air, might help our, our expanding taking advantage of some of these growing mar international markets for cheese. And just wondered what your thoughts were on looking at the southeast as a potential region for uh, an additional dairy processing facility. Uh, I think wherever uh, is a great idea, but the southeast offers a tremendous opportunity. Um, you know, along those same lines, uh, being able to differentiate, differentiate uh, dairy uh, uh, here in Pennsylvania from the Walmart herds and things like that, uh, looking at at animal welfare standards, looking at uh, production standards, uh, whether they're, uh, you know, cows are on grass uh, for a, a period of time. Um, but yeah, I think, uh, you know, the infrastructure that we have, um, you know, in southeastern Pennsylvania offers tremendous opportunities uh, and may have, uh, you know, that same infrastructure from an environmental standpoint uh, offers some advantages. I think any area that uh, is interested in putting processing in uh, would be, you know, an awesome thing to do. Um, no matter where we look for these processing facilities, we have to make sure the market's there. You know, I think that's sort of what's hampering some of, you know, the hesitation by, you know, either the larger producer or, you know, the processors or even, you know, your value added on farm. You know, you can make the product pretty easy, put the plant in place. It's getting to make sure that that market's there. So that's, I, I think that's our biggest challenge right now. You know, if we can do something value added that's different and capture something new, that would be tremendous for the dairy industry. I would agree with um, everyone else that it doesn't, I, I think as long as we can get the plants in place, because I know about a month or so ago, I was told that they were, they were even looking at a location in Perry County, my area, to put a plant in. But I strongly agree with Representative Mole. One of the biggest things is marketing, because milk is a perishable product, so getting it from point A to point B in a designated time is important. But as I said, I was a dairy farmer until 1981. Even back then, I've lived through the buyout program, everything else, and my number one question has always been, why are we the only industry that's restricted that we can't say our product is 96% fat free? It's 98% fat free, you know, because perception is everything. So I think that along with the location of the facilities, we need that marketing initiative that's going to make the homeowner, the, the, the millennial wife of today, want to put that food or that product on her table. Sorry. And I'll just, uh, I don't want to in any way contradict the earlier comments, but I think we need to remember that Pennsylvania is number one in the nation for farms that sell direct to the customer. No other state has that ahead of us. And so a lot of the farmers um, do have markets built in, are selling direct to customer, but without that processing infrastructure, and I'd say it's the same for livestock processing, there's a huge impediment in being able to deliver to our customers what it is they're demanding. And often when it's the value added for dairy, um, that includes some of the regulatory roadblocks, but I know we've been working with the department on easing some of those. I'm really looking forward to a future where those roadblocks are, are relieved for our farmers because customers are demanding what they're demanding and they're just gonna buy it abroad if they can't buy it here in Pennsylvania. Yeah, thank you, and I just want to point that we, um, for the marketing part, we did the Philadelphia delegation. Many of us have, uh, we circulated a letter, I think was mentioned earlier, encouraging the school district to start serving dairy because it is good for our young people despite some of the perceptions and it's good for Pennsylvania's economy. Thank you, Representative Snyder. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to publicly thank the Grange and the Farm Bureau. It's no secret that Representative Kristen Phillips Hill and I have worked diligently in a bipartisan manner on the rural broadband issue. And Wayne, you couldn't be more correct. Everyone on these grounds right now is touched by this issue, even if they don't realize it, whether it is 
farmers competing in the global market, whether it is about telemedicine, kids being able to do their homework, adults being able to take online classes, and most importantly, it's about jobs, too. We cannot attract industry to rural Pennsylvania if the company cannot have access to what they need to compete. So this is a challenging issue. Um, we are going to have our first broadband caucus meeting on September 25th at the Capitol. I would encourage all my House members who have not joined the caucus yet to please do so. There is strength in numbers and I would just ask the Grange and the Farm Bureau to continue supporting us on this issue. It's challenging. We have to find a way to generate the resources because I believe we can get there. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Representative Lawrence. Thank you, Chairman Vogel. Um, my question is with regard to the $5 million um, dairy program that was approved in this year's state budget. And the, my understanding is this funds right now, the, the guidelines are being developed for how the, those funds are going to be distributed. It's going to be a grant program. My question is, is that I'd be very interested in the panel's thoughts on where do you think the most efficient use of that $5 million would, would be? How you, what, what would your suggestions be as we're looking as, you know, applications are coming in? And certainly that will be under the executive branch, but still I'd be very curious as to where you think those, those limited resources would be best allocated. I think that there, there's actually probably two parts. One would be the grant program that would help farmers uh, with developing their processing facility. The, ex the second part would probably be uh, with helping with marketing. Like I said, you know, we can encourage the farmer to have that on-farm processing, the value added. We also need to have the market along with that. So I, I think part of that would be, you know, working with Extension and the Department of Agriculture and, and sort of uh, understanding the local market and, and developing a, a good business plan to make it effective and, and very efficient for that farmer. Thank you. You know, the, no, the number one um, request we get in this area is for assistance for, uh, from conventional grain farmers to transition to organic. Um, the United States is the number one producer of soybeans and is also the number one importer of organic soybeans. Every soybean farmer in Pennsylvania could transition to organic and we couldn't meet the market need. I know on my own farm, we raise pastured poultry. We can't possibly get fresh grain for our, for our, um, for our poultry. And so we do not, mar even though the rest of our farm is certified organic, we can't market it as organic and we would have honestly an endless market for it. So assistance, for conventional farmers who want to transition is going to be really important in this um, scenario. And I'll reiterate with uh, Rick that, that marketing, I, I think, is a, would be a big part of it, but along with marketing would be education, going back to educating the public to undo what about 30-some years of being told that milk fat is not good for you that you know it causes obesity and everything else we need to reverse those thoughts especially since they've been proven wrong and so uh, again in in conjunction with marketing a part of marketing is education thank you very much. thank you thank you mr chairman well we're just about right on time here so i want to wrap up at this point in time i thank our panel members for being here as well as secretary of agriculture redding and uh, Dean Roush from Penn State for being here on our panel with us this morning. I want to thank everyone for being here. I thank all the FFA leadership team for being here and sitting through our hearing this morning as well. Nice to see you all here. And I uh, thank all the legislators for coming out today to be here and with us. And everybody, uh, enjoy the rest of your nice sunny day here in Penn State.